My dearly beloved in Christ, you know that today, the second Sunday after Easter, is called Good Shepherd Sunday because we have a reference to our Lord as the Good Shepherd both in the Epistle and in the Gospel. And especially in the Gospel, we find our Lord calling himself the Good Shepherd. I am the Good Shepherd, and I know my sheep, and mine know me. And there is a bond there between a good shepherd and his flock, the members of his flock. And then our Lord goes on to contrast the image of a good shepherd who will sacrifice himself for his sheep with that of a hireling. And the hireling is there just because he wants to earn money. It's a paycheck. He's doing a job, but when there's danger to the sheep, the wolf comes, the hireling flees to save his own skin because he's not so concerned for the sheep. The opposite is the case of the good shepherd who interposes himself between the sheep and danger that he might protect the sheep. Now, our Lord, of course, is par excellence, the good shepherd, but every priest and bishop must strive to imitate the example of our Lord and be truly a good shepherd. And we have this example down through the course of church history. Especially you think of the great missionaries who traveled and exhausted themselves, wore themselves out to spread the gospel, to reach souls, to bring them to the truth, to dispense the sacraments and so forth. It is interesting, in the Latin, the gospel has the word mercenarius, a mercenary for hireling, which really is the same thing. But it brings out more, what is that false shepherd, what is he interested in, in money? Now, this reminds me of the sin of simony, which plagued the church in the Middle Ages, there were great saints like St. Peter Damien and Pope St. Gregory VII who fought zealously against the sin of simony. Simony is trying to purchase a spiritual good with money. And it is named after a certain Simon that we read about in the 8th chapter of the Acts of the Apostles. And this man lived in Samaria and was a sorcerer. And he deceived the people, and they were very much taken with his sorcery. But when the deacon Philip went to Samaria and was preaching the gospel, many people were converted, including this man, Simon. And then, because there was such a large number of converts who had been baptized but not confirmed, the message was sent to the apostles in Jerusalem to send a couple of apostles to give confirmation to these new Christian converts. And so Peter and John went to Samaria, and they confirmed, they laid their hands on these newly baptized Christians, and it says the Holy, Ga the Holy Ghost came upon them. Now you know the story of Pentecost, how the Holy Ghost came upon the apostles, and they went forth and they spoke in tongues. And they were filled with the gifts of the Holy Ghost. So in those early centuries, there were extraordinary gifts of the Holy Ghost that were given, such as the gift of prophecy, the gift of tongues, the gift of healing, and so forth. And that's what happened in Samaria. And this man, Simon, saw this and wondered and thought, I want that power that these apostles have, that they lay their hands on these new Christians, and the Holy Ghost comes upon them. And so he went up to St. Peter and said, I want that power. How much money can I give you so that I can get that power? And Peter was horrified. And he said, may your money go with you to perdition. For you thought that the gift of God can be purchased with money. Your heart is not right with God. Repent. And Simon was horrified at these words, but his name has been given to this sin, the sin of simony. And as I said, it plagued the church in the Middle Ages. There would be, for instance, wealthy families who maybe had a son that became a priest and they would try and 
bribe individuals in authority to get him made an abbot or a bishop, etc. We even find in papal elections, sometimes where cardinals were offered money to vote for this candidate or that cardinal, this person or that person. What a terrible sin. We also know that Martin Luther accused, falsely, but accused the church of selling indulgences at the time of the rebuilding of St. Peter's Basilica in Rome and used that as his excuse for leaving the church. Now, of course, it was not being done, but perhaps there was a semblance because no spiritual good can be sold or bought with money, whether it's an indulgence or an office or anything of that nature. When you request a mass to be offered for your intentions and you are asking the priest to apply the spiritual fruits of that mass to a certain person or for your intentions, that is called offering a stipend. You're not purchasing those spiritual benefits, but is the custom to provide a stipend for the well-being, for the living conditions of the priest, for his livelihood, so that he can support himself and is not a purchasing of spiritual goods. And in fact, in normal times, a bishop of a diocese will lay down in ecclesiastical law the amount of stipend for a a mass to be offered for one's intentions, for a baptism, for a wedding, etc. There were specified amounts so that the priest had a guideline in that regard. But again, it is an offering for the priest, not a purchase of a spiritual good which cannot be sold or bought. So getting back to the good shepherd, we think of, for priests, they must imitate our Lord. And we look at our Lord, how he exhausted himself, how he labored. He traveled by foot throughout Palestine, spreading the gospel, curing so many individuals and doing all that he could to spread the message of the kingdom of God. Several years ago, I was in town in, in a store somewhere and a man came up to me, noticed I had a Roman collar dressed like a priest and Oftentimes, people will start a conversation by saying, are you a Catholic priest? So that's what he said. Are you a Catholic priest? Because, of course, sometimes it might be a Greek Orthodox or maybe even Episcopalian. Sometimes their ministers will wear uh, clericals, a Roman collar. So are you a priest? Yes. And he began talking to me and then telling me he was a Protestant. And he was holding or teaching, conducting a Bible study session once a week in his church. And he was so proud of that. And he said to me several times, I'm not getting any money for it. I'm doing this. I did this once a week and I'm not getting paid for it. And all I could think of is that that thought is so foreign because as a priest, you do all you can for the good of souls and don't think about why well, I should get money for this or I should get money for that. Again, it is so contrary to the example of our Lord, the Good Shepherd. So that is where the word hireling comes in, or a mercenarius, a mercenary. He wants money for protecting the sheep. But notice that the good shepherd, as our Lord says, loves the sheep. He knows them. I know mine, and mine know me. There's a bond there between our Lord and his sheep. And that is the example that priests, bishops, and religious seek to imitate to be like our Lord, to be ready, even willing, to lay down one's life for the sheep and always to seek the spiritual good of souls, not one's temporal advantage. And may we all love our Lord, our good shepherd, and serve him faithfully. As St. Paul concludes in today's epistle, that now, you have returned to the shepherd and guardian of your souls. At one time you were sheep going astray. We must return to our Lord, the good shepherd, and be always faithful to him who is faithful always to us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.